so welcome to to all of our WAPOR members, to all of the members of our various chapters around the world, and also a welcome to our visitors and guests. This is the first WAPOR webinar of 2024. And for those of you who are familiar with WAPOR webinar, webinars, you know that we try to have eight or so a year, and we try to focus on a mixture of methodological topics, of substantive topics, and of regional topics where we share uh, the expertise of our many, many members and, and, and affiliates around the world focusing on regional issues. But, but this topic is, is one of our substantive ones. And, and we started thinking and talking how we really wanted to do something related to the environment. And of course, there are a lot of ways that might be done. There's some very popular ones, but, but, but one thing that is perhaps less promoted, but critical in thinking of the impact of environmental change is, is water and water security, water being something that is, is critical for, for health, for nutrition, for agriculture, and for security. And, and in keeping with our weight poor interests, we wanted to focus on ways of thinking about and conceptualizing and operationalizing and understanding this and measuring this. And so we're just delighted to have and honored to have a, a couple of researchers, um, Sarah Young, uh, from Northwestern University and Pablo Parras from Data OPM in Mexico, talking about a new way to measure water insecurity, which is a set of scales, survey scales, um, that measure water insecurity experiences. And so they're going to share this, this work with us. Um, I know many of our researchers here um, are often looking for ways of measuring something. And indeed, one of the the strengths of WAPOR is that, that we have people who do research in so many different countries. And one of the real strengths of, of cross-national research is that, is that by having identical validated scales, we're able to measure things in different cultures, context settings, and water is something where there's a lot of variation and a lot of change and something that's just critically important. Um, so I am just delighted to be joined um, by Sarah Young and Pablo Paras. Uh, Sarah will talk first, then Pablo will talk. Sarah is an associate professor of anthropology um, and global health at Northwestern University in Chicago, although she's joining us now from, from Cambridge, England. Um, and uh, her research is focused on quantifying human experiences and problems with water and unpacking all of the, the various um, issues related to that um, in terms of nutrition, health, and well-being. And so she's going to scare, share this scale with us today. And Pablo Paras is the president and founder of Data OPM. Um, in Mexico. He was the director of the Center for Public Opinion Research and associate director at Mori from 1997 to 2003. He's been producing and analyzing market and opinion, public opinion data in Mexico and Latin America since 1990. He's directed more than 200 surveys. And I would just like to say Pablo has been um, fantastic in offering omnibus surveys in Mexico and encouraging and working with academics, including some of my students, to add questions, which is just one of these wonderful ways that as researchers, we can, we can all share and grow and build by putting things together. Um, so without me taking up any more time, I'm going to ask Sarah and Pablo just to, to share with us um, the water insecurity experience scales and some of your research. Thank you, Chase. Um, thank you so much for having us here. It's really an honor to be with the Waypour crew. Um, I hope that you feel comfortable to interrupt with any questions or at least type them into the, the chat 
box if I'm giving the right instructions here. Uh, because I want to be talking about what's useful and interesting to you. Professors are good at blathering on, and I, I don't want to do that. So I am going to talk today about water and water insecurity. Yes. Okay, great. I can change my answer. I'm going to talk about, you're going to hear me say HYs and IYs a lot. So let me tell you what that stands for. HYs is household water insecurity, insecurity experiences scales. And IYs is just the same thing, except measuring at the level of the individual rather than the household. And both of these scales consist of 12 questions. They take three minutes to administer and they're completely open access. So you can get to them by going to wisescales.org and you never have to talk to me again. You can talk to me. I welcome you to talk to me, but it's out there for the world. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk you through what the insights are that they offer before I like kind of explain what they are. But this should give you this sort of opportunity to say like, nah, I can do something better with my next hour. Like, oh, hey, I want to be part of this kind of new way of thinking about water. And then I'll return to this slide at the end. So these wise scales are offering new insights and I'll show you those new insights that they're offering. For, and they're doing this in a few ways. They're bringing a human voice to a sector that's been really dominated by infrastructural and engineers um, measuring things that you can touch. But these are much more proximal to human being, a human well-being than standard indicators because we're not saying, is there water out there? We're saying, is there water in my life the way I need it to be? What's particularly interesting to, I think, pollsters is that we can these data are gender disaggregated because when you're measuring at the level of the individual, then you can see what the differences are between men and women or any other individual characteristic like ethnicity, like religion, like <clears throat> education. These wise scales have been used now in 50 or more countries, and we have shown that those data are comparable across time. So we can see changes across time in the same place. We also know that they work across infrastructures, across climates, across cultures. <clears throat> they are global. And they're not a heavy lift. I mean, the 12 questions take about three minutes to administer. That's the, the time that Gallup has quoted us on, and time is money on polls. So three minutes is a, is a, a fair estimation of the burden. And the, the analysis is really quite simple. It's just arithmetic. <clears throat> multiplication. For those of you who know food insecurity, this is this type of questions will be familiar to you because we, we talk about the water insecurity experiences scales. The wise scales is like the sister scale to brother food insecurity. And you'll hear more about that from Pablo, who is really fundamental in getting the food insecurity experiences scale to be the global phenomenon that it is. I'll also show you that these data have a lot of different uses that they can be used for prevalence or for making decisions about targeting resource resources to see what the impact of big investments in infrastructure have been. And I'll also give you some examples of how they've been used for advocacy. <clears throat> so like these data we are seeing already, like make things happen. And you know, point number eight, this is scary. Accountability is a very scary word, but we're seeing that um, political leaders are saying, and we can use these data to hold stakeholders accountable, which is both appealing and scary. But for all of these reasons, this these wise scales are being talked about by as being in the post-2030 sustainable development goal agenda. I mean, water is not, <laughs> problems with water are not going away anytime soon. And there's agreement that we need better data. Um, so this is a slide that I used when I presented this to the water group at the World Bank. I don't know how closely all of you follow the mission statement of the World Bank, but for those of you who don't follow it closely, you should know that they recently changed their mission. So the president talked about widening the aperture of the World Bank <clears throat> to create a world free of poverty, and this is the new part on a livable planet. And that that wasn't part of the, the mission before. But it's not a hard argument to make <clears throat> that our world isn't livable without water. 
And so water, even just if we look at the bank, is, is more and more on their radar. So I'm gonna break this talk. That was like the abstract of the talk, if you will. But I'm gonna break this talk into three parts. And I'll talk to you for maybe 10 minutes about what the scales are. Then I'll talk about the evidence of their utility. Like, don't just believe me that they're they're useful and, and changing the way we do things. I'll show you some proof. And then I'll talk about the opportunities that, that exist here. But again, if you have any questions during this, please um, type them in and um, Chase will, will interrupt me with them. Okay, so the backstory. This is the, the kind of story that doesn't go into all the peer-reviewed articles that we write. And this is me as a baby assistant professor 10 years ago in Kenya. I had a million dollars from the National Institutes of Health to study food insecurity and its role in maternal and child health. And um, I can't remember if I if Chase said my training. So I'm trained both as an anthropologist and as a nutritionist. So with my nutrition hat on, I know very well how to measure food insecurity. Depending on the scale you use, there are eight or 12 questions to assess it. With my anthropologist hat on, I wanted to make sure that I was asking questions to these moms that were irrelevant, that they were asking about things that mattered to them. So we did some ethnography to, to, to find out from them what mattered. <clears throat> and one of the things that really mattered to these women was water. And one of the exercises we did was we gave women cameras to go and take pictures of that which shaped how they fed their infant. And this is a picture that a woman took. Now you can't quite see that her, can I just ask, can you see me? I can't see myself, but can you see the video of me? Yes, yeah. we do. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Okay, so I can use all my hand motions. So this woman's belly is out here. She's very pregnant. And you might be wondering though, why is she going to fetch water? Because there's a big water tank behind her. Well, her mother-in-law, stage right is no, that's stage left <laughs> is not letting her use that water tank so she had to go very far to fetch water and ended up going into premature labor with you know serious consequences both for her and for the eventual infant and that like water wow I, I'm, I'm here studying food but water really matters and so I wondered could we measure water insecurity in this panel study I mean it, it was beautifully if I can say beautifully set up study where we were measuring food insecurity at all of these time points. So every black dot, you were, we were measuring food insecurity. Let me just add water in here as well. I went to see, like, you know, ran to the literature, eager baby assistant professor to see how people were measuring water. And what it turns out that water indicators at that time, or what that what was available then didn't measure consumer perspectives. <clears throat> so looking at different indicators, people say the word water security a lot, but for those of you who know food security, the term it's used to cover all manner of sins. I mean, food insecurity can mean undernutrition. It can mean hunger. It can mean lack of dietary diversity. Well, with water, people were using the term water insecurity mostly to measure physical availability. So like, is there water? If you take all of the water in Kenya and divide it across the people in the country, is there water? Or we were looking at infrastructure physically available. That's actually a, the sustainable development goal indicator for water right now is if there is a tap within 30 minutes round trip that's accessible when you need it. And then of course, there are a lot of indicators of water safety, like contamination, like E. coli or arsenic or lead. But what I was looking for was this whole a holistic measure that got at if people could access the water if they had it for basic household needs, but not swimming pools, but you know to brush your teeth, and if that stuff was reliable across time, like if it was stably there. And <clears throat> I had this idea, not I, I'm I, I'm basically copying from the food security world. I mean the way we track progress towards SDG, SDG2, so that's zero hunger, is by looking at the proportion of people who are food insecure or not. 
And these are the data from 2023. And, you know, we in Food, the food sector, we used to measure how many calories were produced in a country divided across the population and say, this country has enough food, these people are food secure or not. But it's easy to poke holes in that as an assumption because not all food is distributed equally and not all food is created equally. So same thing for water. We can't rely on knowing what's out there and dividing it across the number of people. Let me let me give you an illustration. Let's so go. Let's go back to this mama using the standard water indicators. She would be fine because Lake Victoria is not far away. It means there's water physically available, not very far away. And according to the infrastructure indicator, which is in the SDG indicator, there's infrastructure on on the property on is called on the premise. But we know she wasn't okay. So I had to do something differently. So in 2018, we um, created the HY scale. Remember, that's the household version of this scale. And that was no small task. I mean, to do that, we collected data in 28 sites from 8,400 households. And we picked these sites. These sites are not the, like the one in Merida is not representative of Mexico. But we wanted to pick places that really stress tested the questions to figure out which were garbage and which might actually be universal. So you can see places on here with high density population. You can see places with very little infrastructure, very hot, very cold, and so on. And this was um, a, a labor of love. There was blood, there was sweat, there was tears, there were statistics. And all of that is not what I'm going to talk to you about today. All of this stuff, if you go to wisescales.org, you can see the all of the papers that underpin how we made the scale. Those are there. What I do want to tell you about is what the items look like, you know, how the scale manifests. So we have the HYs and the IYs version. We started with the HYs in 2018. Gallup broached me about working with them in the Gallup World Poll. So we revised the scale to be, um, we really just modified it to, to change the STEM. So how often have you, is IYs, how often have you or anyone in your household is HYs? And then the, the questions themselves are the same. <clears throat> I'll show you the questions on the next slide, but I just wanna show you how the scoring works. So uh, if you sometimes have to change the food that you eat because of problems with water, you would score a two. If you are often or always angry about your water situation, you would score a three. There are 12 items, so the range is from zero to 36. Um, like I said, it takes three minutes and these questions are open access, so they're, they're out there for the world. There are many translations available. And there's also a user manual that we created right after we did that age wise so we don't yet have a, a manual for the IYs, but it's really quite similar. Um, here's the full phrasing for the questions. I'm I'll just let you look at the screen for a second and along the right, you can see uh, some of the languages into which um, these questions generally it's mostly IYs, but some of these are age wise, some of these are IYs have been translated. You can see these online as well, so I'm going to keep going. So where are we at? At this point, the scale is developed. We, we saw the need. The scale is developed. My hair is getting gray, but it's out in the world. <clears throat> so the Y scales have been implemented now in, I mean, this is probably out of, this is in fact, I know out of date, by a lot of organizations in a lot of countries. And the countries in, in green, that represents places where we have nationally representative data. The red is sites, but many more people, uh, you know, papers just get published and it's in there, are using it without telling me. Um, Gallup really helped us to to get to the national level data, but it's I would like to just like publicly thank Pablo for getting us going in Mexico, which his efforts led to eventually the government of Mexico putting it in the National Health and Nutrition Survey, and Sanut. Um, USAID is having all of their um, member countries. So I don't know if you know the Feed the Future program, 
but that's the flagship food security program. This is mandated, the, the HY scale is mandated to be in the um, midline evaluations they do. But many other organizations are using it, <clears throat> which is exciting. Like I learned last week that Charity Water, which works in 22 countries, is insisting that everyone who's receiving funds from them uh, measures impact with this. And I think that there are kind of two big reasons why this uptake has been so quick. I mean, I'm I'm impatient for everyone to be thinking about water in this different way. So I feel like it's slow, but people who who know say this is quick because of these. So because it works across levels, so we can use it at the national level to understand who's at risk and to target at risk populations. We can use it at the community level, and I'll give you some examples of that to understand what the like what happens with a natural shock or what happens with investments. But we can also use it to understand um, multi-sectoral consequences like within an individual or within a household. So you can say like, if you care about water, you should measure water insecurity. But we now have data tying water insecurity to mental health, food security and nutrition and physical health and prosperity and human capital so that it's it's like a gateway drug, right? So like if you... <laughs> I know you don't really care about food security. Uh, sorry, I like talking with with USAID. I know your mandate is is feed the future. Like you are focused on food security, but we have data to show you that you can't not care about food security and ignore water. There was a double negative there. You have to care about water if you care about food security. And so, like working across these levels and across these sectors, we can see how these data inform investment decisions advocacy and, and policy. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second there. So you now know what the Y scales are. What's gonna happen next is I'm gonna show you seven ways they've been used like real, real world examples. And then I'll tell you how you possibly could use them too. We're good? Okay. So one of the things we've done is make what I call these country one pagers <laughs> where if you are interested, like I presented these these data to the Egyptian government and say like, okay, so this is what the prevalence of water insecurity looks like in your country. And, but then we can go deeper into what, what are the 12 experiences and how does it differ between women and men? And what happens with this is that you can show which groups are left behind. I mean, the, the tagline of the sustainable development goals is like, leave no one behind. But if we're not measuring at the level of the individual, we don't know who's being left behind. So I'll just unpack those country one pagers for you. So with, with the eyewise scale, we can see how water insecurity varies by individual characteristics like gender. So I this is Brazil. And in Brazil, there aren't big gender differences. We can also see which age groups are more vulnerable to water insecurity. And that's the, the 25 to 34 year olds. <clears throat> and these two, like what this, what, like the two key words to convey what IWISE does is that it's more precise because we're measuring it at the level of the individual. So it's more precise than current WASH indicators. WASH stands for water sanitation and hygiene, by the way. But it's also more holistic than current WASH indicators because we aren't just talking about drinking water or drinking water infrastructure. You saw that the 12 questions include like hand washing, psychological dimensions of water security, nutrition dimensions, and um, other stuff. It's more, it's definitely more broad than, than drinking. But we can also, we can look at household characteristics so we can see how water insecurity varies. So on, on the top, uh, the far left is the lowest um, per capita household income quintile. So like the poorest people are on the left and the wealthiest people are on the right. And as you would expect, water insecurity goes down as income goes up. But what I think is really striking, and we see this in many, many countries, water insecurity doesn't go away in the highest income bracket. It's, it's an issue for many people, many places. Okay, so what have these data done? A lot of people are talking about 
you can use different terms, equity, gender inclusivity, but as to our knowledge, this is the only global indicator that is at the level of the individual. And it was a huge boon when um, the WHO and UNICEF used the IWISE data in their report that came out this summer to show differences in, in gender disparities or in, in gender equity with water and security. I mean, they are seeing the value of this. It was, it was a good day. Um, the Asian Development Bank <clears throat> is cares a lot about equity and we're like on the cusp of them paying for um, nationally representative data for most of the countries in Asia. Then the like director got switched. So that was that was a bummer. We we're so close. Um, but that will happen, I hope, I, maybe with some of you to really get data that paints, remember that that map that you saw with the green countries, I want to paint that map green. I mentioned food security earlier. I'm going to show you some global data. <clears throat> so um, the FAO has commissioned Gallup to collect food and security data every year in all the countries in which the Gallup World Poll works. And we were so fortunate and Gallup kind of did good planning so that the IWISE module was in not just the same countries, but in the same households as the FIES was. So we had data from, I don't know, 30, yeah, 31,755 households in 25 countries. And we could see that it, like this is the odds of being um, water insecure. I know, sorry, this is the odds of being food insecure. So that if you are water insecure, if you scored 12 or higher on a range of zero to 36, and I can talk about cutoffs if you want, that people were two to three times more likely to be food insecure than those who weren't water insecure. And this is a huge odds ratio for any public health outcomes. And this has really made FAO pay attention to, to water. If we care about food insecurity, we have to pay attention to water insecurity. It's also promoted interagency dialogue. So I've been learning about how the UN works and how just policy works. And it always surprises me that anything gets done because we're so incredibly siloed. You know, these people do health and these people do agriculture. But this has been great in getting EMI, FAO, and people in the nutrition division and the statistics division and you and nutrition to come together on, it was World Food Day, the theme was water this year, to, to say like, we need to be acknowledging, measuring and acting on water and food for nutrition, water for food and nutrition. I'm gonna take you to a different part of the world now. So in Australia, uh, maybe two years ago, um, some Aboriginal ladies asked, like wanted to measure water security and they found me and, and I told them about the HY scale and they went away and they administered it in this particular city called Walgood. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere and in, in, no, it's not in the middle of nowhere. It's like eight hours outside of Sydney. And they measured water insecurity and food insecurity in their community. And they found that it was very, very high. It was something like 43%, I think, of their of this particular town was water insecure. And they wrote a policy brief that got the attention of the Australia Broadcasting Corporation, which in turn got the attention of the, the local minister of water and really made things happen. <clears throat> in fact, they the, not all of the problems are solved. But this minister basically decided that they would she would do what the the people who had been had been asking for a long time, which is to change the source of water. And you know, they had been telling their stories for ten or fifteen years, and they'd been doing water testing to show the some of the issues with the water quality. But it it just didn't it wasn't compelling. The, like how many parts per million salt in the water was just not as compelling as some of the data that could be generated with the Y scale, like X proportion of people were angry about their water situation. Policymakers don't want their constituents to be angry. This makes them pay attention, even if they don't care about water. So it was really um, 
it was exciting to see that the community could take the scale, implement it, and make action happen. <clears throat> and uh, the other thing I wanted to add to that is that with Gallup, we had done nationally representative sampling in Australia. Maybe, maybe somebody on this call is the one who did it. And we know that the prevalence for all of the country of Australia is like 1.5%, 1.6% is really low. So the, the contrast that having these nationally representative data could offer to, uh, you know, to put into context just how bad things were in Walgut was useful. Um, I talked about accountability earlier. I'll just drive this home. So the wide scale can evaluate impacts of, of projects. And Oxfam was an early adopter of, of this is the HY, which I'm eternally grateful for. And what they did was they had an intervention group in Sierra Leone. And then I think it was like 900 other people who were comparable, but did not have the intervention. And what you can see is the mean score for each of the items. So remember, you can be, the answers are never to always. So never is scored zero, always is a, um, a three. You can see that the orange, which is the, um, the comparison group, scored higher on all of the items than the blue, which is received the interventions. But, and you can look at this either the mean score or you can look at the proportions. And these numbers are like, quick to understand much more so than the like fabulous ethnography that I write or even more detailed breakdown of like which items are more changing. I mean, this was, this really gets people's attention and, and you can see if there's a difference and, and if not. So it, it was great that um, the World Bank has decided to use this in Karnataka and this big project they're doing with um, improving infrastructure for water access in, in Southern India. And of course, all these other organizations are using it too. The climate <clears throat> and water is, it's real. It's a real thing, despite what some policymakers <laughs> are saying. And we're starting to see that um, there's real appetite for, for understanding how water and climate co-vary. So we've given some webinars um, with people who are working in small island developing states. We also have now geospatial data for the, th I think it's 31 countries uh, from the Gallup World Polls, where we can see how the relationship between food and water insecurity co-vary by climate zones or by urbanicity or any other geospatial characteristic we want to map. But I love this saying, if climate change is a shark, water is its teeth. So I was in Dubai in December to present the first look that we've had at how water insecurity experiences and, and climate events co-vary. And that's what you're looking at here. So this is from something like 38,000 individuals in the Gallup World Poll, uh, and then using a database called it's like, I, I should have had it on here. Did I have it on here? It's like the Global Disaster Climate Base, MDAT. <clears throat> and we looked at how, what, what water security looked like for people who had ex been experienced, had been exposed to a month or more of floods, a month or more of big storms, or a month or more of droughts. And what you can see is that exposure to too much water or too, too little of water is associated with more and more severe water insecurity. And that's when we control for all the things that we would expect to also shape water insecurity. Um, last example is from Mexico. And this is using water for uh, wise data to inform efforts uh, for poverty reduction. So what you're looking at here is not a country one pager, but a state. So the state of Nuevo Leon is um, northeast in Mexico. It's one of the wealthiest states. Um, it's also one of the driest. So uh, Tesla, was, it was in the news maybe in the last year, because while we know that there's a lot of droughts in this area, there's also an appetite to have, for example, the Tesla factory be built there. And the government there in Nuevo León was very interested to know 
what's happening with um, water security, both, you know, well, I, I'm not going to speculate about why they want to know. They want to know what's up with water security to get ahead of it, really. And you can see here, this is another example where we would have the national representative data on the right. 16.5% of Mexicans are moderately to severely water insecure. But in Nuevo León, it's 42.6. So I was very like delighted that the um, governor invited us to the palace to sort of sign this agreement that they would be committing to be in the network and to measure water and security experiences as part of and put it in their their question of it's called the checks survey to look at socioeconomic status of people and decide who should be assisted. It's very exciting. I mean, it's like real world stuff that's happening and like these data are informing decisions. So that's part two of the talk. Or if we're still okay, I have like maybe four or five more minutes to go. And I'll talk now about opportunities. So there's just a widely acknowledged need for better data. This is the water action decade as defined by the UN high level panel on water. And in it, they say you can't manage what you can't measure. And it's particularly true for water and major gaps exist. So the UN is saying that, <clears throat> but in the US we're saying that as well. So I normally live just outside of Chicago in Evanston, Illinois. So um, our two senators, luckily care a lot about water so senator duckworth and senator durbin and i i talk fairly regularly with their um scientific aides and one of the aides of senator duckworth said like you know our data on water in the us is like a, a d minus like it's not good and um she in fact wrote a letter to the center for disease control to request that experiential um, data are collect to be collected on, on water in the U.S. as well. And to that like lacuna of data, I say wise data can help. We know it can help both understand water security itself, if we care about water security, we measure it, but we can help us unpack how water is shaping mental health and all these other outcomes that many politicians do care about, and we can use it across these levels. Um, and the World Bank cares about it too. It seems I, they're paying more and more attention to how water shapes poverty. And they agree that we want to be on a livable planet. So um, there's some traction there. So I see like the wise data being able to use, to be used for international leadership. <clears throat> so this is my, my evil plan, full disclosure. Here we are. My evil plan is to paint this map green. And... Uh, not so that I write some more boring peer-reviewed papers that a handful of people read, but because we should know what water is like in the world. We need this for robust policy and as a global public good. Um, and and this is the chief economist at FAO who, you know, said some glowing words about the value of experiential measures at a, a conference that we held in April in, in Mexico City. Um, it's also really useful for national governance. This is kind of the second in command of Indonesia who visited Northwestern. And he's, I mean, he's, I don't, I won't say so much about the World Water Council, but there's a big meeting happening in Indonesia in a May. And the, the governor, the government is listening to what's up within the country and the disparities within the country. Um, when it comes to water and security data. And we see this in Mexico, we're seeing this in Brazil, we're seeing this in the US and so on and so forth. The private sector too, um, I'm an academic, so I know about <laughs> research. I understand less about companies, but I'm starting to see the many ways that these, that there's an interest in understanding what the experiences are, where the products are produced, but also where the products are consumed. And of course, NGOs and bilateral organizations and humanitarian entities care deeply about water, both water for its own sake, but water for what it does for the world. So in summary, you now know what the Y scales are. I've talked about seven types of utilities that they have in terms of showing inclusivity of gender. 
and understanding phenomenon like food security, promoting interagency dialogue, use for advocacy for resources, impact evaluation, and anti-poverty programs. And then the opportunities are to inform policy at the level of the international, national, and the private sector, and then in NGOs. So I'm going to conclude here. I'm going to leave this slide up so you can see now, now that I've talked you through them, I think these insights might be more intuitive. And I'll just encourage you to reach out to me <clears throat> at any point um, for any questions or clarifications or explanations. I'm I'm more than happy to do to, to help you to help the world think differently about water. Thanks very much. Well, Sarah, thank you. Thank you so very much for this really, really interesting, important presentation. Um, Pablo Barras is now going to talk with us about um, kind of some applications in Mexico. We can't hear you, Pablo. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, Constanza Chase, the rest of Wayport, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm just the local pollster here. Sera is the real star. And I have three objectives with the next 10 to 15 minutes. I want to try to, to share with you my experience in Mexico using both the food insecurity scale, and more recently, the water insecurity scale, and um, convince you that it's a, a real opportunity for local pollsters and has many potential benefits. I also would want to, to, to ask Waypur to do and have a, a better practices, to have best practices, and become a more robust know-how sharing network and uh, finally, to end up, and probably as part of a, a social responsibility uh, as a group, to, to become a global knowledge generator. Uh, and basically what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we need to find the Sarahs of the world and help them achieve painting the world map green uh, sooner rather than later. Um, so let me tell you about my, my experience. Uh, before CERA, there was Rafael Perez Escamilla who introduced me to food security. Uh, I was a graduate student at the, uh, in the United States and in the university that I went to, there were probably five Mexicans. So eventually I got to know all of them and Rafael was one of them and he's an expert a uh, globally recognized expert on, on food security, one of the leading ones in Latin America. And he invited me to lunch one day and we were talking about how we, he was advising the Brazilian government for the Fome Cero program to, to measure and implement uh, monitoring of uh, food insecurity in that country. And I naturally asked him, and what's the situation in Mexico? And he told me we have never measured this in Mexico. So. Together, uh, Rafael and, 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 um, and, and I conducted the first measurements of food insecurity in Mexico. It was all done pro bono. We basically took the, to, to the scale and put it in some of my uh, polls. And um, this, we, this, this got the attention and, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, Mexican authorities. And uh, we convinced the America's Barometer to include the, the, the index in their 2008 uh, national sample. And with that, uh, uh, Coneval, which is the office in charge of measuring poverty in Mexico, uh, asked us for the data set in order to start complementing its poverty indicators. And after that, Coneval asked INEGI, which is the office of the census, to start measuring this with a sample of 90,000 households. Uh, and uh, uh, INEGI and Coneval have been measuring this 
ever seen. So uh, it's probably one of our, of, of our biggest contribution as a small pollsters to have put uh, uh, food security in the in the radar of 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 the important indicators that are being measured in Mexico uh, regularly. Uh, Rafael and I got invited in 2010 uh, to to um, a meeting that FAO has every 10 years to present the case of Mexico because they wanted to see if they can replicate that experience in other countries uh, through local pollsters like ourselves. And uh, they also had the alternative option, which was to use the Gallup World Poll, uh, which meant a lot, uh, uh, a bigger investment. And they ended up doing, and, and they do a wonderful uh, uh, global measure, uh, uh, measurement of food insecurity using the Gallup World Poll. Um, As, as Sara was saying, we, we did in collaboration with Northwestern with another uh, Mexico university, the Ibero, and with an NGO, uh, Acción Ciudadana Frente a la Pobreza, which is um, Citizens' Actions Against Poverty. And they all shipped in and we put it, uh, we, we did not only the measurement, uh, the first measurement of HYC in Mexico, but also its validation. We, in the same questionnaire, we included the food insecurity severity experience matrix, the general anxiety disorder and the water scarcity indicators. So we were able to have external validity and sufficient information to validate that the HYS uh, uh, scale uh, is, uh, is is reliable and and, 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 and and valid for Mexico. And as Sara was saying, this, the, 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 the scale is very easy to, to apply and very transferable to languages and to culture. And we, 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 we did find uh, uh, higher incidence in rural areas and women respondents that it was correlated, as Sarah was saying, with food insecurity. And after that, we got another client, another colleague uh, that wanted to test the same scale, but with a different uh, response scale, binary as, as, as with food security, instead of a four scale uh, response option. So we, we got out of our uh, uh, promoting the, the first measurement of HYs, we start getting uh, clients after that. So the benefits of, of, of finding the Sarahs and doing local, locally is for us and what we've done is both for the food insecurity and for the HYs, after we did the measurement, we did press release, we published some op-eds in national magazines or, uh, or radios. And then after that, uh, we, uh, we or, or the groups involved produce academic papers and we made the public, uh, the data set public, publicly available for whoever who, whoever wanted to, to, to work with it. And these for our company generated us visibility. Uh, we can say now that we're building new areas of expertise in very important uh, uh, areas that we're, we're gonna know, we know that they're, uh, they're gonna keep demanding uh, these types of, of service in the futures. We've, we've been able to present these tools for uh, current clients like local state governments or uh, NGOs. And of course we have generated uh, new clients. So this is something that whoever's listening to this in the Wayport network and which is a local pollster uh, like me, an opportunity to do it locally and it would uh, it, it 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 would reap benefits later on for that for that company. So we need to find something that is current, relevant, relevant, relatable, and easy to communicate. And this is a slide that I think Sarah presented a couple of times. And again, I think Wiper should have a publicly available list of all the potential relevant. Uh, indicators and indexes that are out there uh, that we as local pollsters and researchers can uh, use as a, as, a, as a resource 
and see if they have been measured in our countries or not and see if we can get them measured. So I'm not gonna, again, Sarah did a, a wonderful job uh, uh, relating the relevance of HYs. I'm just highlighted here. This is quick to collect and simple to analyze. This is also part of the of the of the of the uh, of something that we need to the type of indicators we need to look at. Something that is not going to take a lot of space in our surveys, and that we are going to be able to uh, uh, disseminate to different uh, uh, actors within our countries. Um, and finally, and, and I'll stop with that and, 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 and let the Q&A begin if there are any uh, comments or suggestions or questions. In the Dubai meeting a couple of years ago, I presented the results of Mexico. And at the end of my presentation, I, 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 I presented this idea uh, that Wayport should uh, function as a global knowledge generator uh, network. Uh, with something that I call GRIT, a global report on important topics. So the, the basic idea is that find indicators like HYs that we can present every year. Imagine that in the banquets uh, uh, awards meeting in the annual conference, the chair of the conference validated by the uh, the, the, press, the current president, the past president, or uh, whichever committee that can be involved um, tells the network community, okay, this year we're gonna measure water insecurity globally. This is the quick way to do it. Whoever is interested, please do it in your country and send us back the results in the next eight, 10 months. And I've, I've spoken with Sarah about this and she will be more than, than happy to receive those surveys and process them and help Wapor uh, create a global report on this. So this is sort of like a shortcut for the Seras in the world to, to achieve what they're passionately pursuing in a much uh, quicker time frame. And I think this is something that Wapor can do and should do. In that, uh, after that meeting, uh, well, Colin, uh, our Colin, our colleague Colin Irwin was in the, in the, in in this session, and he has suggested that probably the roadmap of things that we need to measure each year as a as a, as a global network has can be the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and as you can see there, we have our work cut out for us for the next 17 years. We can start with water. Uh, insecurity, which is the, the number six. I'm going to do a zoom there so you can uh, better see it. But these are all very important topics. Poverty, hunger, health, education, gender equality, uh, energy, and, and, and whatnot. So after uh, hopefully in the cell meeting uh, this coming July, we can get this going with water insecurity and then we can look forward for next years of what kind of uh, 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 important topics we're going to measure as a global research network. And that could be a very important contribution of WAPOR. So that's sort of like my, my evil plan, as Sarah was saying. She has her, I have mine. I, I hope we as a WAPOR can get our act together. And I think this is very achievable with very and being very efficient with the resource uh, we have uh, available as a network. So I'll stop here, Chase, and uh, give you the microphone and open it up for Q&A. Thank you. So, wow, Sarah, Pablo, thank you both very much. Very inspiring and 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 Pablo, a very ambitious but 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 not unachievable sort of proposal. I I I look forward to to chatting with you in Seoul about that and seeing seeing this advocacy. Do we I, I want to open this to the floor. If there are any questions, please submit them or put them in chat. Um 
And so we have a quick question for Sarah. What were the main challenges of the, of the construction of the scale? Um, and are, are the, the, the results different? Um, I don't know how many of you work with professors, <laughs> but I wouldn't say we're known for um, ease of compromise. You put 12 professors in a room, you'll have 13 ideas about how things go. So um, it was an art and a science to go from 32 items to take it down to 12. And it, it, even just for myself, it's hard to, to make decisions about uh, what we wanted to ask and what we didn't want to ask. Um, and every time we were wavering, like, should we add that or should we not? Think about the usability. Like we really opted to make something that was easy to use and easy, you know, questions that were easy to understand like less is more in this case. So, um, you know, it's hard to get consensus, but we got consensus and, and a huge group of people worked really hard to make this happen. And then it's hard to not ask all of the questions that we wanted to, but you can always add questions to the 12. And, and I'll, I'll answer, no, I'll add also <clears throat> that as soon as we had published the 12 items, an economist wrote and said like, hey, great scale, but it's a little long. Have you got something shorter? I'm like, damn it. <laughs> we just finished the scale. Like the ink wasn't even dry yet on the paper. But a, a very wise person, his name is Ed Frangillo. He knows a lot about scale development. He said like, basically, girl, either we can decide what the short version is, or we can let someone else decide what the short version is. So we also made an even shorter version that's one minute long. It's four items. Um, I, of course, would strongly encourage the 12 item because it um, you can talk about severity. So moderate, mild, severe, which you can't do with four items. Uh, but and that was really handy in the time of COVID when everyone was doing everything by telephone and everyone was just driven crazy by it all. Um, so that, that was handy and it's useful. I would still encourage the 12 item. Um, the results of the household and individual scales, are they different? Not really, but there's a very interesting analytic opportunity to ask two individuals in the same household what, what the deal is. Uh, it's, I call it a he said, she said. <clears throat> and in fact, that's going to happen in Kenya in January where, I, I mean, the the statistical analyses suggest that women and men are answering these questions in the same way. Like there doesn't seem to be different gender differences, for example, in understanding them. There does seem to be different prevalences of water insecurity by gender. So generally they don't seem different and the, the questions themselves are the same with age wise and i wise uh, but to know how they really differ you would need to ask within the same household and so that will be answer forthcoming and it will differ by country i'm sure um we do see themes there's the like there's a couple of hygiene questions so like washing your body washing your hands there's a couple of the um, emotional themes, but these are, we're calling the scale unidimensional, like these, because they hang together differently in different places. And the purpose of this scale, the, the number one thing we're trying to do is get data that are comparable globally. So because some, like some of the domains emerge differently in Asia than in Kenya, well, than in Africa, for example, we're calling it unidimensional and not breaking it up really uh but you you can slice it how you want great encourage any more questions um i have one perhaps i i know um is the example sarah you mentioned australia which is not a country which we would generally think of as having a lot of water insecurity overall but we have regions that do and i think that's probably true in most countries um where there's a lot of 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 localized and regional variation. And I know Pablo mentioned doing a study of 90,000 interviews in Mexico, which I can imagine would let you drill down to some of those regional differences. How do you think about measuring that, for example, in something like the Gallup World Poll, where you're, you're just gonna have far fewer interviews and might not be able to tease out the areas where, where there might be sort of extraordinary differences between water insecurity in one place versus another.
Yeah, I mean, evenly or like similarly asked comparable data. And but there's also shortcomings, like unless you like oversample hard, you can't get at, at state differences and you certainly can't get at county level differences. And that's where different types of polls are, are really critical. I mean, the other thing that we're not getting at all is any health data. And I'm doing all of this because I, I care about health. I mean, I care about water and I care about food, but I care about it in the service of helping vulnerable moms and babies be as, as healthy as they can. And so um, it's been great to get that nationally representative data like that. There's a lot of other opportunities to put this in places where health data are being collected or higher resolution surveys for sure. Thank you for that question. And and so Sarah and Pablo, this is from um, um, <laughs> Caroline Deshek. Um, can you mention more detail about the validation of the HYs against the FIs um, and regions specific findings, references to follow up on? Yeah, I'll put the paper in. I, I, I can't talk in type, but in a hot second, I'll put the paper in there so you can see what all, all of the, the nitty gritty of what we did. Um, I, th I think one of the strongest findings is it, well, the most impressive finding was just how strong the relationship was and that the relationship was pretty consistent across all of the regions in some uh, analyses that we did for world food day, which as I mentioned was themed water this year, we looked at how, if, if the relationship between food and water held by it's called climate type. So Coupin did a climate classification like, are the relationships as strong where it's dry? Are they as strong where it's temperate? Are they as strong in, there was one other, I can't remember the third climate type, <clears throat> but we saw some variation. And that then begs the question that we can't answer with those data, which is why? Like, what are the pathways between water and food insecurity? Is it food production? Is it that you can't afford food? Is that you don't, are you too busy fetching water to have time to cook? I mean, we, we don't know what those are, but we can think of a lot of pathways and, you know, some we see in the United States. And actually, we saw this in Mexico, too, in Nuevo León, that people don't have any water to cook with. So then they're drinking Coke, which is cheaper than water, and buying prepared foods, you know, you know ramen and, and chips and candy, because it, you can eat those immediately. Um. <laughs> So I'll put the reference in the 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 relationships held um, by region, and we can't look away from water now. Now, if we care about food, those are the three. Pablo, maybe you want to add to that though. Just just in your comment, Chase, um, I think whatever at whatever level that you can manage to get the first measurement, it can get the ball rolling. In our case for food security, the first one we did was Mexico City, and that helped us uh, get interested for the national survey. And after that, for example, we have we have been able to convince local government at the state level, in, at, in our case, with at least three different uh, government state levels. Uh, with with uh, H-wise, as Sarah was mentioning in Mexico, uh, the, the the government of Nuevo Leon was interesting. I know this has been, I think, uh, measured in Merida and, and elsewhere. So um, I, I, I think I think I think the the important thing is to 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 get it out there and do the first you know uh, um, incidents that you can show to 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 audiences, and that would get uh, people interested, and and you can then get them uh, measured at different levels. And I don't know how quickly um, you you guys do your work, but World Water Day is March twenty second, and there's um, that's a nice like inflection point. I, I was thinking about making some of our country uh, prevalence data public, and that could be like those one pagers for the the forty countries that are green, and that might be interesting and useful for like you know if you are working in Brazil but you're working in one particular town or state, you could put into context what you found with the, the national data that, that we have. I'd be happy to share that.
I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit how stable or, or unstable do you think water insecurity is as a phenomenon? Is this something we need to measure once every decade, once in a lifetime, once every year, once every couple of months? What's the right, right? Oh, great you know. question. Um, so I can tell you that um, in the Ensenu, so that's a national health and nutrition. Well, actually, Pablo, I'm sorry, I'm talking more. Do you would you like to answer that question? No, you're the expert. I'm just the pollster. <laughs> okay. You know more than I do. <laughs> okay, dang it. Okay. Um, so <laughs> in the Ensenut survey, which asks about um water insecurity. It, it's stayed at 16 something percent for the last three years. It's been asked every year for the last three years, but that's with a, a year long recall. I do believe. The thing is, is that water insecurity varies a lot across the year. So I told you when we went from HYs to IYs, we changed the, the, the STEM, like how often have you personally, instead of how often have you or anyone in your household, that's one change. The other change is that we did a one year recall instead of a one month recall, which is what we'd been doing in, in other surveys because it's more precise. Like if you want to get at health data, you want a really precise exposure. But if you're trying to get at prevalence, you want to be able to compare across precipitation and differences in temperature across the year. So for the purposes of estimating prevalence in a country, if you have a one year recall period, I would go every other year. If you're trying to predict a health outcome like depression, I mean, I would measure it every month and ask about the last, you know, I mean, you, you know, higher resolution data is useful, but to get at relationships, a shorter recall period is more precise, but for making comparisons, you want, you want a, a year. That was a lot. Did that make sense? It does. It does. Thank you. Um, and so Colin is 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 making a no great presentation. We will take this forward in Seoul. So thank you, Pablo. Amazing that you reduced your scale to four questions. What were they? Could we do this for all the UN SDGs? Um, I mean, we have reduced it to four, but 12 is better than four. Three minutes only versus one minute. But OK, you can use the one minute. Um, the SDGs are monitored in different ways by different, there's, you know, different guarantors of it. And so sometimes it's survey data that are used. Sometimes it's hydrologic data. Sometimes it's, I mean, it's all different things. So I don't know that um, this could be, this technique could be used for all the SDGs, but I do know that um, we are missing right now, the human voice from the water sector. And this is, uh, I think a, a solution to enrich in our understanding of water globally that I, I hope is taken up. What were the four indicators that you reduced Gosh. things to? Uh, you would ask me that. It's on the website. I'll, I'll have to check. I'm going to misspeak, but I will. I will grab that right now while we are talking. Mm -hmm. And 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 there was a discussion. Um, great, thanks, Sarah. I've discussed this with Pablo before. Some common interests in our work with food and water security and migrants, um, and I'd be glad to follow up with you more soon. I guess one of the things I'm thinking of this brings up: migrants are a sort of special population. They're not <laughs> geographically; they're they're almost by definition not put in a place. Are there other types of populations that that maybe fall outside of our traditionally regionally um, <laughs> surveys that we would think, especially of focusing this on? Um, so that's a, a fantastic um, question. So non-institutionalized adults, 15 or older, are who Gallup talks to. Um, there's a lot of populations who that doesn't cover, that doesn't cover kids. I think we have a real opportunity to understand. I'm not saying that this should be used for kids. I think the scale is the starting point, but probably some mods for children. Um, I teach in a maximum security prison in just outside of Chicago and Stateville. The water conditions there are horrible. I had no idea that that was like happening in the U.S., I think that we need to be measuring institutionalized populations like prisoners. Not that school is a prison, but schools also have a whole host of, of water and sanitation issues in, in many, many countries. So we're working on developing a scale now 
kind of like I scale development is hard. I don't know how many of you have developed skills, but it's not for the faint of heart. And after I did the first one, I was like, never again. Then that economist was like, make a shorter one. And then Gallup came along. I like, I keep making skills, even though it's hard. And I would rather just administer them and look at the data. But I think we need to develop one for sk for schools, for prisons, migrants, you know, refugee populations, children. I can think of a, a lot of other scenarios. Following up on the idea of rather being a, being someone who administers a scale, we have a question from someone who administers scales and field surveys from Constanza. Um, are there methodological specifications to field the index, or is this the decision of the local agency? Pablo, can you take that one? I'm not sure what that means. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, like Sarah was mentioning, I think you have this published in several languages, right? The, the Your suggestion of how the wording of the question should be. And uh, what we usually do, what we did in Mexico is look at it, uh, see if we need to uh, tweak it a little bit to tropicalize it because of some uh, specific uh, modisms of, 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 the, of Mexican Spanish. And, and I'm sure that would be the case um, anywhere. And then we pilot it to make sure that it uh, it was working as as we as we were expecting it. And and finally, and again for the the, the first time we did it, we tried to build it up not only to measure the scale but to have additional correlates so we can validate it and and see that it works as we expected and do some analysis to make sure that it's unidimensional and uh, and, and, and the incidence uh, differences between the items were as expected. But yes, I, I think the wording is pretty straightforward. You might would want to do a small adjustment for your specific culture or country, but uh, I, I think I think Sarah and her team have done a very good job of having uh, having out there a very polished product that it can be with very little effort uh, uh, apply immediately. It's it's been used. I take it mostly in face to face surveys. It sounded like maybe some telephone. Um, any other modes? Face to face and telephone have been the main one. Um, Unilever did it on cell phones. They, um, so people that was like self-administered, like do, do, do answer the questions that way. Mm, um, I thank you for answering that question, Pablo. I now understand it's like, okay, how do you make sure that you're asking it right? There, there are words that are sensitive, like anger. And people get angry talking about the right translation of anger. I mean, so it's, it, there is subtlety. And I mean, as you know better than me, it, it's an art and a science to to do poll administration. But I there aren't a lot of complex terms and people do find their way to an, uh, a translation of thing. You know, laundry is pretty universal. Anything here that would be sensitive where you might have an interviewer effect, someone wouldn't want to share? Um, shame is definitely the most sensitive question. So is how often have you been, have you felt shame because of problems with water? And you'll notice that all of the questions cover our phrase problems with water. So it's too much or too little or poor quality. We're not only talking about drought situations here or only flood situations. And um, in a couple of places in Sudan, and where else? One other place said, like, we can't ask that question about shame. <clears throat> and um, and so we didn't. So then they used an 11 item one and we just adjusted the cutoffs and, and that was fine. Um, yeah. But Excellent. more or less, even when it is like shameful, like in a, the example is Australia. Like there are, I mean, there's racism everywhere. And one of the sort of, racist tropes of Aboriginal people is is that they are dirty. And so to talk about this and to talk about the shame of that is it's super laden. And it's it's heavy, it's heavy stuff to talk about not being able to feed your kids, like with food security stuff. And it's it's heavy stuff to be ashamed no matter what the cause.
Um, and although it was sensitive, it was answered and answerable and very empowering to talk about ultimately. Do we do we have any final questions coming in? So Sarah and Pablo, thank you both very, very much for this extremely interesting presentation. Um, so just a just a just a a great measure of thanks from the World Association for Public Opinion Research and and all of the participants here and all of the many people who will stream this in the future. Um, as many of you know, of course, these are available on the Waypour um, web page. <clears throat> um, and this is sponsored by the World Association for Public Opinion Research as part of its mission to promote international cooperation and exchange among commercial and academic researchers, journalists, and political actors. And I would just like to, to point out that this particular topic and project and our selection of panelists has really exemplified that um, with the exchange among um, academic researchers like Sarah, commercial researchers like Pablo and, and work that's that's influencing journalists and political actors. And of course, we invite you very much to our website at waypoor.org to consider becoming a member. Um, we we this is is going to be archived, and you can of course go to the Waypoor website and get access to all of our many um, all of our many uh, webinars. And I would just like to finally uh, invite you to our next. Um, Waypar webinar, which is not being shared from my PowerPoint. Um, but our next our next webinar is going to be Thursday, February 29th. Um, it's going to be the Afrobarometer and the design of cross-national surveys by Dr. Boniface Dulani, who's the director of surveys at the Afrobarometer. And so I would just very much like to thank you all for joining us today and hope that we see you um, in the future at other webinars, including our February webinar on cross-national surveys and the Afrobarometer. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chase. Thank you, everyone. Delightful. Thank you.